Ron said something interesting that I had uh, missed in the news that apparently at yesterday's uh, European tour event uh, in I think Abu Dhabi said that uh, Jordan Spieth was penalized one stroke for pace of play. So so it, it, it does happen. Um, yeah. All right, uh, rule seven dealing with practice. And this rule is broken up into two sections dealing with before, between rounds, and then during the round. Uh, before or between rounds, in match play, the player may practice on the course. That is okay. Stroke play is going to be very different. The player not only may not practice, but he's also not allowed to test the surface of a putting green by rolling a ball or by roughening or scraping the surface before a round uh, of a stroke play competition or when two or, two or more rounds are scheduled over consecutive days between those rounds. So why the great difference in uh, results there between match play and stroke play? Uh, well, I think a lot of it has to do, to do with just the nature of those two forms of play and providing uh, equal opportunity. That, uh, for example, if uh, let's say uh, Ken and I are scheduled to play a match at 8 o'clock uh, tomorrow, then in theory we each have the equal opportunity to go practice on the course before our 8 o'clock match. And the players who might say if Bill and Arnold have a 10 o'clock match, they really don't care if Ken or I practice on the course before our own match. Uh, then, you, uh, uh, however, in stroke play, what if Ken has a 7 a.m. starting time and I have a 2 p.m. starting time? Then I would have a much greater opportunity to practice on the course before the round, which doesn't seem right uh, with regards to Ken. So that's why in stroke play that is not allowed, but in match play that uh, is okay. But notice that in the note, the committee may flip that, may prohibit practice on the course for the round and match play. Because, for example, maybe the committee says, look, you know, our maintenance staff has their hands full and they don't need all these golfers out there getting in their way. And it, or, so they might prohibit it in match play and stroke play, they might permit it. For example, they might say, look, this is our, this is just a club tournament. Uh, Ken is a dues paying member of the club. Why shouldn't he be allowed to play this course whenever he wants, even if it's uh, between rounds, if he wants between Saturday and Sunday's round, if he wants to go. Uh, play nine holes with his son Saturday evening. You know why not allow that? He's not going to gain any additional information about the golf course. Uh, stroke play there is in breach of this uh, rule. He would be uh, disqualified. All right. So now uh, during the round, uh, uh, during the play of a hole, a player may not make any practice strokes. Period. Uh, between the play of two holes. He is allowed to make uh, some practice strokes in some limited circumstances. And that is, that he's allowed to practice putting or chipping, no other type of stroke, on or near the putting green of the hole last played, the practice putting green, or the next team ground, provided that, that a practice stroke is not made from a hazard and is not unduly delayed uh, play. So, what uh, does that mean? Let's say that uh, a player is in a group, they, they're making the turn, they get to the 10th tee, and there's a backup on the 10th tee. So where could the player practice putting or chipping? He could go to the ninth green, his last hole. He could go to the practice putting green, if that's nearby, and he could practice putting or chipping on or near the next uh, team ground. Notice that team ground is very specific. That let's say if uh, Andy and I are playing in a turn, we're playing from the uh, blue tee markers, then that means that we can only practice putting or chipping on or near that uh, blue uh, two club length area defined by the blue tee markers. So that means that we cannot, for example, go to the back tee 50, uh, 30 yards behind and practice putting or chipping. Uh, that that is not permitted. So practice during the round is restricted by the type of stroke and the location for those practice strokes. So you have to meet both criteria. So for example, you can't practice putting or chipping on another team area 30 yards away. And likewise, you can't hit full shots from you know, on or near that next team ground. It's only putting or chipping. 
can you in a situation where you you got a two day tournament and say your ball is just say the the hole is up front and you think it's gonna be in the back hmm. tomorrow. Can you once you finish that hole, can you either cut towards an area in the back of the green or can you roll the ball okay. toward the back of the green before you leave that? All right, hole? all right. Good 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 question. Jim asks if the player uh is playing a multi-round tournament, tournament, and he has a su suspicion as to where the hole is going to be the next day. And maybe there might even be a dot of paint out there already. And he says, oh, I want to get a le leg up on everyone and see how this is going to uh, putt tomorrow. After he finishes that hole, can he go putt towards where he thinks the uh, the next day's hole location will be? And the answer is yes, that that, that is okay. However, though, Look at uh, note two at the end of the rule. The committee may, in the conditions of competition, prohibit practice on or near the last putting green and prohibit rolling a ball on the putting green if the hole last played. And that is really there for the professional level where the tour players say would be likely to do that for the very reason you mentioned. But uh, otherwise, that is uh, absolutely fine to do. All right, now the rule per has kind of a curious sentence saying that strokes made in continuing the play of a hole, the result of which has been decided, are not practice strokes. So what does that mean? Uh, well, let's go through uh, an example. That, uh, and that's, uh, well, we'll look at a couple of decisions in that regard. Uh, decision 7-2-1.5. In a match between A and B, A holds out for four. B lies four, and his ball is in a bunk. Thus, the hole has been decided. So we know that even if B holds a stroke, he'll lose the hole. So we know A wins the hole. If B plays from the bunk, the stroke will be considered a practice stroke. Now, why is that an important question? Because you can't, between the play of holes, practice from a hazard, from a bunker. And that answer is no, that's not considered to be a practice stroke. The strokes made in continuing the play of a hole, the result of which has been decided, are not practice strokes. So that means that B may play that bunker shot and not be penalized. And then the next decision uh, uh, also uh, adds further clarification as to what is meant by continuing the play of a hole. So let's say we have a case where um, uh, Bill and I are playing a match against each other. And uh, we hit our uh, tee shots down the fairway. Bill hits his second shot up onto the green 10 feet from the hole. And I hit my uh, second shot uh, out of bounds. And we go up there, I find it's out of bounds, and I, I can see the hole to Bill. So the hole has been decided, Bill went in the hole. That I, if I were to drop a ball near where, say, my ball had gone out of bounds and just play on, even though I might be 50 yards away, so I'm not chipping and I'm not on or near that putting green, uh, that would <coughs> not be considered a practice stroke, which means it would be okay for me to uh, do that. That, as the decision says, its interpretation is not restricted to continuing play of the whole, the whole in accordance with the rules. All right, now the exception. When play has been suspended by the committee, before resuming play, the player may practice, as provided in this rule, anywhere other than on the competition course, and C is otherwise permitted uh, by the committee. So with that in mind, take a look at the very last decision, 7-2-12. This is similar to, that, to the fact situation, at least, of the decision we saw under 6-8. In a stroke play competition, the committee suspends play and schedules a resumption for 8 a.m. the following day. Player whose group will be <coughs> the third to play from a particular tee wishes to continue practicing on the designated practice area after play has been resumed at 8 o'clock. Because his group won't be able to play at 8 o'clock. What's the ruling? Well, when play is resumed at 8 o'clock, the exception to this rule no longer applies, so therefore, He's uh, restricted to practicing in accordance with the rule itself. So we know from 6-8 that the player has to be at the tee 
when it becomes possible for his group to play. So this uh, decision deals with when, uh, where he may practice. So now, once the eight o'clock strikes and the committee uh, sounds the horn to signal a resumption of play, he can only practice as uh, permitted by the rule itself. So let's say, for example, if he's going to resume play on the fifth tee, that he could practice putting or chipping on or near the fourth putting green, or the practice putting green, or the uh, 15 ground, but uh, nowhere else. So he can't uh, hit full shots on the uh, practice area, for example. All right, uh, penalty for breach of Rule 7-2 for either practicing during the play of a hole or practicing between holes in a manner or location not permitted is the uh, general penalty. Uh, the first note, just something to keep in mind that a practice swing is different from a practice stroke and may be taken anywhere provided you don't breach the rules. So, for example, in a bunker, it's okay to take a practice swing as long as you don't actually touch the sand uh, with the club. So, what's the difference between a practice swing and a practice stroke? Uh, it's that a practice stroke involves the intent to strike a ball, and a practice swing does not uh, involve a ball. Let's see, with the decisions. Which one? 7 1B slash 5? Always. Oh. That's, does that come up a lot? Okay, all right, well, we'll find it. All right, well, let's look at it. In stroke play, a competitive academy practices on or tests the putting green surface of the course before a competitor tees off. Is the competitor disqualified? Answer is no, because he's responsible for the actions of his caddy only during the stipulated round. And that's uh, an important uh, distinction, because if the answer were different, then uh, think about what would need to take place before your round, especially, say, if you don't know your caddy. If you go to a course uh, and you pay, you have a caddy assigned to you, do you really want to make the player at, you know, interrogate the caddy? Okay, since midnight, what have you been doing? <laughs> you know, for a lot of reasons, we don't want to go down that road, do we? So it, the, you're responsible for your caddy's actions only during the round. But what is interesting, on the professional tour level, where uh, they're obviously very conscious of this, that, uh, as you can imagine, they're not crazy about the idea of the caddies going out say the morning of the round and finding that day's whole location, putting down their digital level to get some readings and things like that. So from a purely disciplinary matter enforced by fines, they require caddies to stay off the putting greens uh, uh, between rounds. Yeah, this is an interesting question uh, online. Uh, does the note to Rule 7-2 apply to Rule 7-1, and his meaning is before a stroke play event, may a player dig in to a bunker with his feet and strike hand in the bunker without striking a ball. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's look at uh, before the round and during the round, variations of that. So let's say... Um, that uh, Ken's invited me over to Hidden Glen, never played there, but uh, want to get a feel for their bunkers. And we're, we're playing a stroke play competition there. And uh, before I get there early, I go out onto the course, I go into a bunker, I dig in with my feet, and I take some practice swings, striking the sand. Any penalty, any breach there? Answer is no, because I'm not practicing, I'm not making a practice stroke. So, uh, so no penalty beforehand. But then, let's say we've now started the round. First hole, uh, I managed to hit the fairway, hit the green, make a par. But then leaving, I think, wow, staying in the bunkers, uh, uh, given how much it rained last night, that could be tough. I wanted to feel for what the sand's like. So on the way to the second tee, I stop in the bunker, and I dig in. I take some practice swings and hit the sand, uh, touch the sand with my club, any breach there. Answer is no, that, that's okay also. The, the only prohibition is we'll see next week on Rule 15 for testing the condition of a hazard as when your ball is in that hazard or in a similar hazard. So that would be okay to do.
I mean, it doesn't seem right. And if it's someone were, were to do that, you'd look, uh, it would look odd, but that is allowed uh, by the rules. John? Yeah, John. Under the next uh, decision of 7 Oh, okay. Okay, so the question is with decision 7 1B 6, 54 hole competition be played on three consecutive days. Second round was canceled. And the point of the decision is that people cannot practice on the course on that second day because it was the term was scheduled to be played over consecutive days. And your question, John, is if let's say a two or three round tournament in the first round is canceled. Um, then are you are you allowed to practice on the course automatically on the first day? Um, let's see. When two or more rounds are to be played over consecutive days, and it says, and the answer says because the competition is scheduled to be played over consecutive days. But my concern there is that I don't think you're you're not between rounds, so I'm not. I don't think. There's a problem with that, with that. But I, I think in either case, like in this case, it makes a lot of sense for the committee to say, unless it just wants players to stay off the course just for the care of the course, it makes sense to allow players to do that. Good. And how did well, what did you do? Well, we had we sent the morning wave out. Oh. The course became unplayable after about okay. two holes. Canceled the first time. Uh, after waiting around about four or five hours, the course was somewhat saturated, and we had around another two hours, basically eating lunch. And some of the kids started to get stop raining, get a little bit nicer. And competitors, we were gone, but competitors had asked the course oh. if they could play, and the course had let them out. Yeah, I, I think that's right, because the rule talks about practicing between those rounds, and there hasn't yet been a round. <coughs> so I agree, whereas in the decision, they have played one round, so they are practicing between rounds. But yeah, that's a good, good question, John. All right, let's see. Let's see. Rest us, decision 7 2 slash 5 comes up occasionally. During play of a hole, player saw some balls from the joint practice range line on the course and flicked one back to the range with his club. Is he in breach of this rule? Well, it depends on the circumstances. Sometimes the hitting of a range ball uh, back towards the range would be a breach of rule 7 2, but the casual flicking of the ball, apparently only for the purpose of tidying up the course, is not a breach. So a player can't just set his bag down and then hit a full eight iron back to the range. But if he's uh, just uh, really flicking it back with the sole purpose of just uh, tying up the course, then that's okay. That's not considered to be a practice stroke. All right. Any uh, questions on Rule 7? All right. Uh, on to Rule 8. And last week, we talked about definition of advice, and that's really the hardest part in dealing with Rule 8-1, because the rule itself is straightforward, but often the challenge is knowing whether a, uh, the information being given or being sought uh, would constitute advice. Uh, during the stipulated round, the player must not give advice to anyone in the competition playing on the course other than his partner, or ask for advice from anyone other than his partner or either of their caddies. All right, first point, uh, this rule applies only during the stipulated round. So that means, for example, that if, uh, say, playing in a stroke play competition, play is suspended because of uh, bad weather, that before resuming play, I can get advice. I can uh, ask Bill, look at my uh, uh, putting stroke uh, inside locker room or what have you. That, that is uh, fine to do. 
So a player must not give advice to anyone in the competition playing on the course other than his partner. So if uh, Bill and I are playing together, but we're not partners, let's say we're fellow competitors, and I, and on the fourth hole, I uh, hit a six iron, I come up well short, and Bill doesn't say anything, doesn't ask anything, and if it's his turn to play next, and I say, Bill, uh, you should hit at least a five. I came up short with a six. Am I in breach of the advice rule? Yes, I've given advice to a fellow competitor playing on the course. Is Bill in breach of the advice rule? No, no because he, he didn't ask for advice uh, in that case. Uh, and player may not may not ask for advice from anyone other than his partner or either of their caddies. What if the player is just thinking out loud? Yeah, sure, it's five minutes, you know. Okay. All right, all right, that's good. Reflect yeah. out loud. Yeah, if, if that's the case, if he's truly just talking to himself and not trying to relay information to a fellow competitor, then there's no penalty. That's why it's great to not do it in the <laughs> Yeah, so as we as I think we said last week, <laughs> why you see a, a number of officials trying not to be within earshot of the player so they can't <laughs> hear hear what the players are saying say. If you and I were playing in a stroke play round, and we came to the 18th and last hole of our round, and I hold a putt or attempted to hold a putt from 20 feet for birdie and basically missed it, tapped in for par, and then turned to you and said, I would play a little bit more break. So that sounds like a question on the coach's quiz. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, but, but the question that is, would not be a brief. Correct. Yeah, yeah. The, let, let's take uh, it's it's a good question because it requires a careful reading of the rule, and also you also need to know a decision near the start of Rule Three as to when stipulated round stroke play is over. So let's say Bill and I are playing the stroke play together, and on the 18th, our 18th hole, uh, Bill uh, putts from 30 30 feet away. <laughs> And uh, he misses, then he taps in. Then I still have a putt on a similar line. He says, John, you, know, you should pay, play a lot more break uh, than you have in mind. Because that sure broke a lot more than I thought it would. So that is giving advice. So the question, though, is did Bill give advice during his stipulated round? No. And the answer to that, this is after he holed out in his final hold. When you look at decision uh, thir three, da three slash three, it says an individual stroke play the competitor stipulated round has ended when he has completed play of the, the final hole. Um, so that means his round is over. So rule eight dash one no longer applies to him. So no penalty for him in that case. And is there any penalty to me? No, because I had not asked for advice. Now it would be a breach if I had said if I had asked for advice from Bill, even though Bill had finished his round. Because you're not allowed to ask for advice from anyone other than his partner or either of their caddies. So to look at this, take a look at decision 8-1 uh, just to get uh, comfortable with the penalty structure and, and you know, who is penalized and when. Uh, and keep in mind the two different aspects of the rule. You're not allowed to ask for advice, you're not allowed to give advice. In a singles match play, if A asks for advice from B, then what? As soon as A asked for advice, A was in breach of Rule 8-1. So A lost the hole, and it's irrelevant whether B answers. In a four-ball match, A and B versus C and D, if A asks for advice from C, then we know that what? A is going to be disqualified from the hole and C gives advice, well, then C is disqualified from the hold because A's breach did not determine, did not decide the hold because B and D, you know, are still in it. Now, in stroke play, and this is where it gets the difficult one, if A asks for advice from B, A incurs penalty of two strokes. But if B answers, i.e. if B gives advice, he also incurs a penalty of two strokes. And that's difficult. That Bill and I are on, staying on the fourth tee. I say, Bill, what club are you going to hit? And he says, John, I'm going to hit six iron. 
that we're each penalized two strokes. And that's difficult because human nature is what? When someone asks you a question, to answer it. And to be able to have the discipline and awareness to stop yourself from answering that is, uh, is difficult. All right, and we'll, we'll look at a few other decisions relating to uh, the advice rule later. I have a question. Yeah, yeah Ken. Uh, this happened a number of years ago in a PGA, Wisconsin PGA event, where a player on a par three hit a shot and skipped it. And then he took the club, number facing out, and walked back toward the, his fellow competitor, showing them the number on the club. The rules official was standing there, and he penalized the player. The player appealed to the committee, and the committee overturned the rule, overturned the breach, the penalty. Would you say that was the correct? Well, it, 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 the answer will depend as to what type of um, conversation you have with the player. That if the player, there was no conversation. Well, I mean, oh. the, the the committee I think needs oh, to I'm have sorry. a conversation with the player to determine if there's a breach. If the player was holding his club uh, to to uh, and showing it to his fellow competitors for the so that they could see what he hit, then I would say he has given advice. But if he says, oh, no, I wasn't doing that. I was just walking back to my bag. And if you believe that, then there's no breach. Um, <laughs> you know, so it, it's, it's, and that's one of the tough parts. You have to be determined what he was trying to do. It's a little bit like Kyle's comment of, we say, oh, geez, I should have hit one more club. I should have hit a five iron. If you just say that to yourself, uh, that's fine. But if you say it with the intention of influencing, say, what club. Your fellow competitor is going to use, then you're giving advice. Well, this rule just is so quick. You probably know what it is. Wow. All right, with uh, 8 2, uh, indicating the line of play, and this is broken down to uh, uh, other than on the putting green and on the putting green. And there are some differences uh, between the two. With on the putting green being uh, more restrictive as to of what the player may do. Uh, the player may have the line of play indicated to him by anyone, uh, but no one may be positioned uh, by the player for that purpose uh, uh, on or close to the line or an extension of that line beyond the hole while the stroke is being made. So the common example of this is you have a blind shot over a hill Let's say your fellow competitor or caddy goes to the top of the hill to show you the line, but then the fellow competitor or caddy needs to move before you actually uh, make the stroke. Now, any mark placed by the player or with his knowledge for this purpose uh, must be removed before the stroke is made. So it's okay to place, say, a towel on the top of the hill as long as it's removed before you actually play. All right, 8-2B is uh, going to be much more restrictive. When the ball is on the putting green, the line of putt may be indicated before, but not during the stroke, by the player, his partner, or either of their caddies. So you think about partner and e or either of their caddies, they are also what? The only people from whom you can ask advice. So that means asking for it to have a line of putt indicated is really treated the same as essentially asking for advice. Uh, previously, under Section A, Anyone can indicate the line of play. For example, the blind shot on the putting green line of putt can only be indicated by your partner or either of your caddies. But in so doing, the putting green must not be touched. Uh, a mark must not be placed anywhere for the purpose of indicating the line of putt. So must not be the mark must not be placed anywhere or at any time for indicating the line of putt. That even if you um, say put a water bottle uh, beyond the hole in the fringe of the green uh, to serve as an aiming point and then remove it before the stroke it's still a breach as soon as you place that water bottle there for that purpose uh, it's a breach uh, penalty for breach of this rule uh, for all sections is loss or uh, two penalty strokes yeah. um, it says in decision dash eight dash two b slash three if I substituted the word fellow competitor 
in place of the word caddy. What if the player asked that fellow competitor, where do I lean instead of what is the line of this play? Okay, so we have an online question dealing with decision 8-2B slash 3 saying, if I'm uh, imagining this correctly, that let's say that Bill and I are fellow competitors. Uh, my ball is just off the putting green. I ask Bill, my fellow competitor, where I should aim to play my shot, i.e. for how much the chip shot can break. Would that be a, a breach? And the answer is yes, I would say that was a breach of Rule 8-1. Because in this case, and there is a difference, uh, I don't want to spend too, too much time, but there's kind of a fine line between indicating the line of play and suggesting the line of play. For example, asking someone, you know, if, if Bill and I are playing a course that he's familiar with that I've never played before, we get to a blind tee shot, and I say, Bill, where's the hole? And he says, John, you know, you see that fur oak in the distance, that, uh, that's the right center of the fairway. And he said, okay, got it, thank you. That that's different than, say, our standing on a tee, and Bill saying, here, John, you want to hit it down the right side of the fairway because the ball will kick to the left. Then he's really suggesting how I play the shot rather than just indicating a factual line. And same with the chip shot here, that with the chip shot, assuming you don't have a blind chip shot, um, but if you're just chipping from off the green, you can see everything. And I asked Bill, basically, you know, where should I aim? I'm really asking for advice. I'm asking him, where should I play? I'm not asking him a factual question, such as, uh, you know, where, where's the flag stick? Where's the uh, center of the fairway or, or what? No, but, I have... but if you were to say, um, but if you were to say, to a fellow competitor that looking at a green, you know that um, the direction of play is left to right, although you can't see it. Mm -hmm. Could you say to him, um, this green slopes left to right? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good point, Ken, because there can be a line between stating what's just physically and factually accurate and suggesting something. So. Let's say, for example, so in Ken's case, where you know a green slopes from left to right, but for some reason it just doesn't look like it. If you were just to say, you know, when, if we're standing in the fairway, wherever, saying just factually, this green slopes from left to right. Yeah, that's a factual statement. But what, what would be a problem would be to say, if though if you were to say, John, make sure you aim 15 feet left of the hole because the green slopes from left to right. Then you've crossed the line. Now you're suggesting how I actually play the shot. Yeah, you know, it'll be, be a little suggestion as to how you play the ball. That's what it might be. Would, 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 what would be a suggestion? Well, just keep even factually saying the screen slopes left to right. The only reason why you're going to say that is to influence the way somebody plays the shot. Yeah, I, I I agree, and it's a good point. It's a very fine line, and it's um, a, a similar situation could be with the wind. You know, what if you and I are sitting in the fairway, and I say, "Geez, I can't figure out what's the wind doing," and you say, uh, "It's uh, against us and from the right." You know, I think you'd say wind direction is just a factual thing, but is it going to in, knowing that could it have an impact? That information could have an impact, but it's not influencing me. You know, if, if you were to say, you know, yeah, it's against this and right to left, so I'm going to hit one more club and aim 20 feet right of the hole. Then, you know, you kind of, you've kind of crossed the line, but just something factual. Which way does the ground slope? Which way does the uh, wind, is the wind blowing? Uh, where's the center of the fairway? Um, things like that are okay, but it does start to get pretty close, and there can definitely be gray area there. And I can, Definitely understand, especially in some cases, you know, you say, well, which way does the green slope? So, geez, you're really saying, which way does this putt break? Yeah. You, you know, and, and, may, and may, you know, maybe there is a line, there's a point where you can cross that line. If I have a five foot putt, and, you know, if I say to you, Andy, which way does the green slope between my ball and the hole? <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, that doesn't seem right. But I never, but I'm trying to figure out, okay, why? 
how is that a problem versus say just general information on the T when you say, okay, it's downhill and then you hit to go uphill to the green, green slopes left to right. How is it different? Uh, I, I don't know. I've got to think about that, but that that definitely doesn't seem right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and jo yeah, John, I know that's a good point. That with yardage books, that they, they they can well, yardage books can have factual information, but often they have try to have plain tip also. You know, like uh, favor the left side, make sure you get one more club on your approach, and things like that. But that's okay because that was all published before the round and and, and everything. But yeah, I know that's that's a good point as well. And you could argue, I don't know if you've ever seen, but at the professional level, occasionally on some courses people make up just green charts going into great with a separate book that has nothing but the green contours. And you could argue that that's just the same. That's purely objective, factual information. But yeah, with the five foot putt though, and I ask you which way does the green slope in these five feet? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that. I have to think about that. Was that that doesn't seem right, does it? Well, in Palm Springs, there's a lake or a town. What's the low point? I forget the name. So if I'm standing in the middle of the fairway, and I say to somebody, "Which direction is it to set set?" Mm. which will tell me. Oh, okay. Is that it? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if you if if your belief is that every putt breaks towards a certain area, it does. That uh, <laughs> and if you and you can, and, but you can't see it because you're behind a mountain or whatever or a hill. Is it okay to ask where's Indio or whatever? Indio. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's absolutely fine to do because and you're just asking a geographical question. All right. That's that's okay. With regard to H dash C D. You were caddy for me, and my ball were on the putting green. But the line of putt would extend through the frame. Mm, okay. Under rule H-2B, I cannot touch the putting green, and you could not in indicating the line of play as my caddy. Mm -hmm. Could you touch the line of putt in the fringe because you're not oh. touching the putting green? Or would that be a violation of Rule 16-1B? All right. So with the situation where my ball is on the putting green, but because of the shape of the green and or the amount of break, my line of putt actually goes off the putting green. I'm going to try to putt it through the fringe. Uh, am I allowed or my caddy allowed to touch the fringe uh, to indicate the line for putting? And I think with there, with 8-2B, there would be no issue. Because 8-2B just says you can't touch the putting green itself. However, as you said, uh, you would run afoul of Rule 16-1A because you would be touching your line of putt. Uh, that even though it's off the putting green, that is still your line of putt. And just for touching it, uh, that would be a breach. Uh, 1A. Yeah, it just says you can't touch your line of putt. All right, let's look at some uh, decisions. Uh, uh, yeah. Can you go into the note? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the note this allows in the team competition the committee to appoint uh, another person who may give advice to members of that team. And then I forget where it's tucked away now. It might be in how to conduct a competition. That publication by the USGA, but the USGA allows in team competitions among educational institutions allows them to appoint two people. Who can give advice? Was that your question? Yeah. So that, that gives the assistant coaches a larger role. And that's up to the committee to decide if they, if they want to allow that. All right, decision 8 1 2, exchanging distance information. This is something we talked about last week, but just for emphasis, that any and all distance information is uh, not advice and is permissible to say. So if if I ask Bill how far my ball is from the hole, that is uh, okay to. 8-1-6 uh, is kind of an interesting one. It can be somewhat of an extreme decision. 
During play of the sixth hole, A asked B what club he, B, had used on the fourth hole, which is a par three of a similar length. Was A in breach of the advice rule? Answer is no. Uh, so really what we can gather from that is any, uh, infor any information relating to previous strokes made is a fair game uh, to say. Even if A is asking that specifically to help him determine what club to hit on number six. So that's uh, okay to say, okay to ask, and okay for it to be answered. Uh, decision 8-1-16 uh, sh shows a fine line for both players as well as for referees uh, to make sure they don't cross it. Uh, B's ball is lined badly. He's deliberating what to do when his fellow competitor says, you have no shot at all. If I were you, I would deem the ball unplayable. Uh, did A give advice? Answer is yes. A's suggestion could have influenced B in determining this play, and therefore it constitutes advice. So uh, that's uh, difficult. What could A have said that would not be have been advice? Could, what if A had said, um, and this is getting close to it, what if he says, do you know uh, all your options under the unplayable ball rule? Uh, which you know is is factual, but then Brand bees could be thinking, oh, unplayable ball rule. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe I, you know, maybe I should. But you know, that's uh, starts that's getting close to the line. But I think that's probably okay. I was probably not quite giving uh, uh, advice, but it's uh, it's something to be aware of, and especially even when you know, when officiating, you just want to lay out the options for the player, let the player decide, and not try to influence the player as to which option he should take. Uh, let's see, 8-1 slash 20, we talked earlier about how the advice rule applies only during the round, so therefore it's okay to exchange advice during the suspension of play. Uh, decision 8-1 slash 22, you know this group does a lot with high school and collegiate golf, uh, just something to keep in mind that if you have to uh, teammates uh, playing together in that format, then unless it's true four ball play, they are not partners, they're just teammates, which means they may not exchange uh, advice. And then that's one thing that'll be interesting to see exactly what the format is of the Olympics this summer, where I, th I think the formats for each, play each country to have two players and uh, play 72 holes of stroke play count uh, both their scores for each round, and I wonder if, or I hope, they would not have the two uh, teammates play together, uh, so therefore they wouldn't, wouldn't be tempted to exchange advice, but uh, but, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, let's see, M8-2 is uh, relatively straightforward. Any questions on rule 8? Yeah, Gary? Uh, going back to uh, the Okay. If the players exchange information after they hit their tee shot on a part three, after they both hit the tee shot and they walk around the green, would that be a penalty? And if not, why wouldn't it be what, what happens during the stipulated round? Okay, so let's say you and I hit our tee shots on number eight, and one of us is short, one of us is long, or, or what have you. And we're walking up to the eighth green, and I say, Gary, what club did you hit? And you say, I hit six iron. What did you hit? I said, I hit uh, seven iron. I wish I'd hit six. Is that a problem? The answer is no, that, that, that's okay. The only time that could be an issue during that hole is, say, if at the time I asked that question, if I asked you, Gary, what club did you hit, uh, it, it was possible, if not likely, that I might have to return to the tee. So, for example, if I hit my tee shot into the bushes or near the boundary and there's a fair chance that I'm going to have to go back to the tee, then I think you would say, then I'm asking for advice. But if it's more of just a curiosity factor, just, you know, I'm trying to figure out why I came up so far short, you know, did I, did I hit it worse than I thought or did I just hit the wrong club or both or what, then that would be okay. Yeah, it'd be, and that'd be similar somewhat to uh, the next decision, 8-1-7.
A plays a second shot, which lands on the green. B does likewise. A then asks B what club he used. Was A in breach of rule 8-1? No. Let me ask you this question. I, um, you know, on the 17th hole at Blue Ridge, you remember the 17th hole? Yep. Yeah. Um, they're in team competition. They're, many times there's a backup on the team. I always oh. worry oh. that when teammates come up, oh. And they all talk to each other. That's normal. But I worry that uh, one will say, what did you hit? Now, the coach could tell him what he hit, couldn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But can the player tell him? Okay, all right. All right, so say 17th tee at U Ridge, high school competition, there's a backup. A player, uh, a teammate gets to the tee and says, um, you know, what are you thinking about hitting? Can he say that? And the answer is no, he, he may not. But he certainly, the coach, though, could certainly relay that information and say, well, John up ahead hit four iron and came up short. You should hit three. Then that, you know, that would be fine uh, for the coach to do that. But, but you're right, that, <laughs> I, that could be a problem when you have a backup on the tee and you well, know, they're going to the talk. Uh, an online question uh, asking if John could go over decision 8-2B slash 2 on page 144. All right, 8-2B slash 2. And it's an interesting decision, and it's one where really uh, you can make a case as to, uh, you can make an argument for a, for a different result. But let's uh, look at it. Player's ball lies on the putting green, and his caddy attends the flag stick for him. The caddy suggests before the stroke that the player aim at the caddy's left foot. Is the player in breach of rule 8-2B? And the answer is broken in, down into two parts, whether the uh, foot was placed there initially for that purpose. If the caddy had placed his foot in position for the purpose of pulling out line for putt, then the player was in breach as soon as the caddy placed his foot for that purpose. Uh, and the breach could not be corrected. However, if the caddy just went up to attend the flag stick, and then once he was there, he looked around and said, oh, here, uh, yeah, aim at my left foot. Um, then there's no breach at that point. But uh, the decision go does go on to say that the player would be in breach of Rule 8-2B if the caddy did not remove that foot to another position um, before the stroke. So really, uh, what uh, the rules makers are saying that at that point, it's almost as if the caddy is almost, uh, if he leaves it there, he's almost be, being deemed to have placed something there for that purpose, and therefore uh, has to uh, it has to be moved. And you know, it, and it's an interesting decision because we can discuss and debate how far that principle applies. And that, for example, what if a player uh, puts his water bottle down the side lane just for the purpose of getting it out of his hand? And then when he's surveying his putt, he realizes, oh, hey, that water bottle is actually turns out to be a pretty good line. I'm going to aim at that. Is he required to move that water bottle before the stroke? Well, we don't quite know from this decision that the principle of this decision might suggest that he would. But on the other hand, uh, the rule itself might suggest that he would not have to move it. So, so I'm not sure what the answer is in that case, but we know that the at least with this decision, that when it's the caddy himself, that he has to move that uh, move that foot. All right. Any uh, questions on Rule Eight? All right. On to Rule Nine. Information as to strokes taken. Uh, Nine dash one. Number of strokes a player has taken includes any penalty strokes he's incurred. For example, it's whether it's taking a leaf from a water hazard or uh, penalty for a breach of a rule. Uh, match play, and this is primarily a match play rule. Uh, an opponent is entitled to ascertain from the player during the play of a whole number of strokes he has taken, and after the play of a whole number of strokes taken on the whole just completed. It is a match play, how your opponent is doing can directly affect uh, your play and your strategy, so therefore you have the right uh, to know that. 9-2b, a player must not give wrong information. If he gives wrong information, he loses the hole. 
So that is uh, straightforward. And then the rest of the rule really just defines what, it, uh, what wrong information is. And notice throughout this that you'll see incorrect information and then you'll see wrong information. That any time a player gives wrong information, he leaves the hole, and that's that. But if he gives incorrect information, he's allowed a certain amount of time within which to correct that mistake and to keep that incorrect information from becoming wrong information. So let's uh, walk through these three sections. Uh, a player is deemed to have given wrong information if he fails to inform his opponent as soon as practicable that he has incurred a penalty unless he was obviously proceeding under a rule involving a penalty and this was observed by his opponent. Or B, he corrects the mistake before his opponent makes his next stroke. All right, so uh, Arl and I are playing together, playing a match against each other. And on the fourth hole, I hit my ball into a lateral water hazard. And Arnold sees me go over, measure two club links from where the ball uh, went in the hazard, and then drop the ball. Uh, I do not have to tell him, Arnold, I'm adding one penalty stroke to take the lead, because he can see what I am uh, doing. Or if I give incorrect information and correct that before Arnold makes his next stroke. So let's say we're on the green, and I lie four, and Arnold lies four. And he says, John, what do you lie? And I tell him something else. Let's say I tell him that I lie five. Uh, and then let's say I putt. It's my turn to play. And then I putt. But then before Arnold putts, I say, oops, Arnold, I was wrong. I did originally lie four. Now I lie five after that putt. In that case, there's no penalty. I've corrected uh, my mistake. And it, it, one point to keep in mind is, is where it talks about but you have to inform your opponent as soon as practicable that you've incurred a penalty. Look at uh, decision 9-2-1, which clarifies what as soon as practicable means. Uh, the phrase is purposely broad so as to allow for consideration of the circumstances in each situation, especially the proximity of the two players. Thus, informing the opponent as soon as practicable of a penalty uh, does not in all cases mean doing so before the opponent uh, makes his next stroke. So uh, let's say, for example, that Andy and I are playing a match, and I'm off in the right trees, and Andy's in the left trees, so we're 60 yards apart. It's my turn to play, and I play, and my ball uh, strikes a tree, and then it strikes my golf bag which we'll see later under Rule 19 would be a one-stroke penalty. But then Andy, who's 60 yards away, you know, can't see what's happened. In just 10 seconds, five or 10 seconds after I play, Andy plays. Uh, so I did not tell him of my one-stroke penalty before he played, but given how far apart we were, we'd say that's okay. That uh, I'm, just because I did not inform him of the penalty before his, his next stroke, does not mean that I did not inform him as soon as practicable. So as soon as we emerge from the trees and meet up, then I'll say, Andy, just so you know, this happened in the trees. And I now lie five, not four. Then that, that would be okay. Uh, players deemed to have given wrong info. And, and with this, I'm sorry, back to the first point. Uh, uh, an important point is the final paragraph of 9-2b. A player has given wrong information even if it is due to the failure to include a penalty that he did not know he'd incurred. So, so that's where that gets is important is what we talked about last week with Rule 2-5. That there's a match play, when's, when can you make a late claim? That if Bill and I are walking down the fifth hole, when could Bill make a claim about something I did during play of number three? Well, that'd only be if, if what happened on number three, Bill was not aware of the facts of the situation. The example we used, I think, was that I removed a pine cone from a bunker in which my ball lay. Uh, so Bill was unaware of the facts, and I had given Bill wrong information. Uh, so which means that I had incurred a penalty, and I had not told him of that penalty. So even the, if 
I knew nothing about the rules and didn't know I had incurred a penalty. I am still deemed to have given Bill wrong information on the third hole. So the significance of that is that Bill can then make a late claim, say, while we're walking down number five, about what happened on number three when he becomes aware of uh, the facts. All right, uh, second point, uh, players deemed to have given the wrong information. If he gives incorrect information during play of a hole regarding number of strokes taken and does not correct the mistake before his opponent makes his next stroke. So now this, we're not talking about as soon as practicable. We're talking about before his uh, next stroke. So Bill asks of what I lie, and I don't give him the correct answer, and then Bill plays. I've given wrong information. And the penalty for that is loss of hole. Third is that uh, after play of a hole, uh, I give incorrect information regarding number of strokes taken, and this affects uh, Bill's understanding of the result of that hole. I've given wrong information unless I correct that mistake before either one of us plays from, from the next tee. So and let's go through two examples of that. Uh, Bill and I have just finished the 12th hole. And Bill says, John, what did you score there? And I say, you know, I scored four. And I say, Bill, what did you make? And Bill says, I had seven, so you won. Uh, so at that moment, uh, what's the, what do we think the result is? We think I won the hole. Now, what if we tee off on the next hole and walking in the next fairway, I say, oh, Bill, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I actually uh, I scored seven also. Then have I given wrong information? The answer is yes, because my incorrect information did uh, result in a different understanding of the result of the hole. That Bill teed off the next hole thinking he'd lost it. In fact, he should have known that he'd lead half the hole. So I had given wrong information in that case. Now, what if we tee off on the next hole and I say, Bill, oh, sorry, uh, just so you know, I really didn't make a four, I made a five. I forgot I missed that three footer. So in that case, has that incorrect information affected Bill's understanding of the result? Answer is no, because Bill thought he lost the hole. Whether I made four or five, he still loses the hole, so it does not affect his understanding. So in that case, no wrong information, no penalty. All right, and in stroke play, the uh, rule is much more straightforward. A competitor who has incurred a penalty should inform his marker as soon as practicable. Notice it's a suggestion, it's not a requirement, because of what's the moment of truth with scoring and stroke play. When you return your scorecard, that's when everything has to be uh, correct. And the decisions. <coughs> uh, let's see, let's look at decision 9-2-6. Uh, in part, this is a, a good good example of the application of Rule 2-2. In match play, A holes out and states to B, his opponent, that he'd scored a four. B, who's already played four, uh, picks up, figuring he's lost the hole. A then realizes he'd scored a five. He immediately tells B, what's the ruling? All right, well, A gave wrong information uh, and A would normally lose the hole. However, given the circumstances that A had holed out and that his opponent had a stroke to have the hole, then per rule 2-2, the hole was halved rather than the normal loss of hole penalty being applied. And then uh, kind of an interesting decision, 9-3-1, uh, which was... Uh, given a new answer a few years ago, but what to do when you have a hole-by-hole -hole playoff, and even though we really don't think about wrong information in being in stroke play, what happens if, um, if, that, if wrong information is exchanged? So the facts are that B has completed the playoff hole in five. Uh, a has a putt for a five and asks B what he's taken. B wrongly states that he holed out in four. So A picks up his ball, thinking, geez, I lost the hole. Um, B then corrects the error. What's the ruling? All right, well, if B intentionally misled A, then B should be disqualified under Rule 33-7. 
But if A made a mistake, or if B made a mistake, B incurs no penalty. There's, uh, there's no penalty for giving wrong information in uh, stroke play. Now, however, and this is where it gets interesting, that in these circumstances, B should be deemed to have caused the movement of A's ball. So in these limited circumstances, uh, Rule 18-4 applies, which means no penalty to either player, and A must replace his ball. Uh, that this uh, is a, a change at more uh, player-friendly position than uh, the answer used to be. Because I'm sure a lot of you remember the answer used to be, well, uh, player B or player A lifted his ball, got him marked his position, he has a penalty stroke. There's no getting around that. That was the old, old uh, answer. Any uh, questions on Rule 9? It is worthwhile to spend some time looking at 9-2 decisions just to get uh, comfortable with the whole concept of wrong information. And, and, all, and as we said earlier, often uh, rules 2-5 and 9-2 go hand in hand. So that's helpful. All right, on to rule 10, order of play. Uh, the first two sections of this rule uh, talk about match play and stroke play. Then the third section for a provisional ball or another ball from the team ground apply to both forms of play. In match play and stroke play, the general premise is the same, but the consequence for playing out of turn uh, is different for each form of play. 10-1A, uh, a side that has the honor at the first team ground is determined by the order of the draw. So if you have, say, match play tournament and you look at the brackets, the name on top will have honor at the first tee. If it's the groupings and stroke play, then you just go by the order in which the players are listed to see who has honor at the first tee. If there's not a draw, uh, for example, if Bill and I just go out and play a friendly match, then the honor should be decided by lot, you know, for example, by tossing a coin. The side that wins a hole takes the honor at the next team round. If a hole has been halved, the side that has the honor at the previous team ground retains it, something I think we all know well. Now, after both players have started play of the hole, the ball farther from the hole is played first. If the balls are equidistant from the hole, or their positions relative to the hole are not determinable. For example, we have one ball way in the right trees, one ball way in the left trees, and you really can't tell whose ball is farther, and then determine the order of play by lot. An exception to all this is in four ball match play where the side may play in order it considers to be uh, better. Now the note is the only real wrinkle uh, to this rule and we'll look at some examples of that because there are several aspects to it. When it becomes known that the original ball is not to be played as it lies and the player is required to play a ball as nearly as possible at the spot from which the original was last played, the order of play is determined by the spot from which the previous stroke was made. All right, so let's look at uh, two examples of that. Uh, let's say Ken and I are playing a match, and uh, uh, Ken hits his tee shot out in the fairway on a par four. I hit my tee shot. And we can tell from the tee that it's out of bounds. There's no question about it. So then, who would play next? Then I would play next because the reference point for determining the order of play would look at Ken's ball in the fairway, and then we'd look at the tee for me because I am required to play under stroke and distance, to play from the spot of the previous stroke. So that's my reference point. And since the teeing ground is farther from the hole than Ken's ball lying in the fairway, I would have to play next. Yeah, yeah so now let's, now let's uh, change the facts a little bit. Where Ken hits his tee shot out in the fairway, and I hit my tee shot into the trees, uh, but in front of where Ken's ball lies. Uh, so we go forward, have my fingers crossed, I'll be able to find it, and it'll be playable. Ken hits his second shot. Then we go forward, search for my ball. We can't find it. We look for five minutes, don't find it. So then, what do I have to do? I have to go back to the team ground. So has Ken played out of turn? The answer is no. Because as Bill says, the key is those first four words. When it becomes known 
then when did it become known that I would have to return to the tee? After Ken had already played. So he has not played out of turn, and I would have to go back to the team round to uh, play another ball. Now let's look at the second half of the note. When a ball may be played from a spot other than where the previous stroke was made, the order of play is determined by the position where the original ball came to rest. Now let's look at, uh, well, there, there are some decisions. Let's just start with the basic one where, let's say, now the next hole, Ken and I are playing, and Ken hits his tee shot in the fairway, and he's 150 yards from the hole. And I hit my ball into a lateral water hazard on the right. And my ball lying in the lateral water hazard is 125 yards from the hole. But where I'm going to take relief is going to be 175 yards from the hole. And Ken's ball is at 150 from the hole. Uh, and I want to take relief. So then who would play next? In that case, it would be Ken. Because what do we compare? We compare Ken's ball in the fairway, 150 out, versus my ball in the lateral water hazard, 125 out. And since Ken's ball is farther from the hole, who plays next? Period. Regardless of what I do, regardless of whether I'm going to play my ball from the hazard or regardless of which relief option I elect to use uh, in, in that case. So one way to look at it is that when you, the player has options, when he doesn't have to play from the spot of the previous stroke, uh, that he cannot manipulate order of play based on whether he takes relief and if so, which relief option he elects to use. Alan, that's so crazy. Ken went back and dropped his ball, so he sort of gave evidence to us that what he's going to do. And then he became on his seven yards, and then he would still be his option to play with his No, it would it'd still be, well, I, I was the one dropping the ball. So if, if even if I dropped the ball at 175, Ken would still be the one to play next. Even though the ball has been dropped? Yes, mm -hmm. even if the ball has been dropped. And be, there are a few decisions that provide some examples uh, of that. Look at this, the very first one, 10 slash 1. A and B hit their balls in the ground to repair. The balls are approximately 18 inches apart. A's ball is farther from the hole. Both players decide to take relief. Is the order of play from the next shot determined by the relative positions of the ball before relief was taken or after? Answer, the order of play is determined by relative positions before relief was taken. So therefore, A will play before B. And then the uh, next two decisions are, offer some similar uh, themes. All right, now in match play, what happens if a player plays when his opponent should have played? Well, there's no penalty, but the opponent has the option, either of letting the stroke stand or by uh, requiring the player to cancel and replay the stroke in the correct order. So depend, you know, it could depend as to how good a shot or how bad a shot uh, the player played out of turn, as well as how nice a guy the opponent has or is. Um, there can be uh, uh, some awkward situations. You probably remember at the Solheim Cup in, I think it was around 2000, when uh, in the four ball match, Annika Sorenstam uh, chipped in, and then the Americans realized she had played out of turn. And after much conferring, they wanted her to replay that stroke in the correct order. Uh, and she did. She didn't make it, but it was uh, it was a pretty uh, left a bitter taste in a lot of people's mouths. But you know, the Americans were certainly within their right to have uh, to have done that. Oh. All right, uh, stroke play, starting play of the hole is the same uh, process. Uh, during play of the hole is the same with the same note. The only difference with stroke play with during play of the hole is with rule 22, in that in stroke play only, not match play, if you are asked to lift your ball because it either assists with someone's play or it interferes with someone's play, that you have the option to play first rather than lift. And we'll get into that under Rule 22. But in match play, you uh, do not have that option if uh, someone asks you to lift your ball. Now, uh, playing out of turn in stroke play is different than in match play. 
that there's no penalty in stroke play and the ball is played uh, unless the committee determines the competitors have agreed to play out of turn for the purpose of giving one of them an advantage, in which case they are both disqualified. So let's say we have a case where Gary and I are playing together a stroke play tournament. Final hole, I've shot myself out of the tournament. Gary is tied for the lead. Uh, we're both on the green. Uh, I am 20 feet from the hole. Gary is 25 feet from the hole, but we're on a similar line. And I go over and tell Gary, I said, look, I'm out of it, but let me at least help you. And I'll, why don't I putt first and show you the line? He says, John, thanks. You know, you're the best. Uh, and then, then as soon as we do that, then uh, uh, we would be disqualified. Is that because we agreed to play out of turn for the purpose of helping Gary? All right, 10-3, uh, provisional ball or another ball from the team ground. So another ball could include a lot of things. Could include uh, a, a situation where you know your tee shot is out of bounds and you're not playing a provisional, you're just playing another ball under stroke and distance. Um, if a player plays a provisional ball or another ball from the team ground, he must do so after his opponent or fellow competitors made his first stroke. If more than one player uh, plays another ball, then the original order of play is retained. So if, uh, let's say, Bill, Ken, and I are playing together, and I have the honor, and I hit one towards into the trees, and I want to play a provisional ball, I will wait until after Bill and Ken play before I play my provisional ball. Um, Let's see, uh, decision 10-1C-3 was revised a few years ago, and it's uh, a useful one to know. In match play, it's A's turn to play, but he realizes he left a club on the previous hole. He uh, decides to return to retrieve the club and suggests that his opponent, B, play first to save time. If B then plays out of turn as suggested, have the players agreed to waive the rules and breach of rule 1-3? The answer is no. And we have an interesting exception and very specific exception here. When done solely for the purpose of saving time, players turn is to play may invite his opponent to play first. Opponent's under no obligation to do so, but if he does so, the players waive his right under rule 10-1 to recall the stroke played out of turn. That would be no different than if two balls were on opposite sides of the fairway and player A says to player B, I think I'm away, and player B doesn't disagree. Oh. Then player A plays, and player B has no has given up his right of recall. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good way to look at that if, you know, can we get out there and say, Ken, whose turn is it? And, um, and you say, John, I think it's mine. I mean, you go ahead and play, and then after you play, I pull out my range finder and say, oh, no, actually, it was my turn to play. You played out of turn. Then, I, you know, I can't do anything about this. I've already agreed to your procedure. And it's 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 a similar to, I think, that decision we talked about in Rule 2-5, where let's say you and I don't know a relief procedure, and we agree that, say, I should drop a ball two club lengths from the cart path, and I do so and play. And then after, afterwards, you can't then make a claim about it because you and I agreed on it so that there was no doubt in me. John, I brought a situation up last year, a very similar situation with Jim and Bird Joe. Uh, it was a four ball match play, uh, A, B, and C, and A hit the ball on the green somewhere. Uh, B is a shank ball, four ball. C hits it on the fringe. B hits it in the green side bunker. B says, Well, I'm going to see the play, I'll play. And says this to A, and A goes, oh, whatever, you know, and so he plays and holds it, and then B says, hey, wait a minute, it's my turn to play, I'm way back here, I guess, and he, he, he stepped, I came on his head, and I made the ruling, and, and I have a rule that whatever, and he said that was an acknowledgement to allow him to play, and I called the USGA after that, and said it was, it was a shaky situation, and uh, I talked to P.J. Hiller about that. He said, uh, whatever didn't constitute an acknowledgement, and therefore he should not have been able to surrender his right to play. 
and therefore my ruling was incorrect. That's what he said. Now, yeah. what you're just saying you know, is, you know, well, maybe, well, maybe kind of like well, it, or whatever. Well, well, part of it is that this decision is new. That this answer is okay. is is oh, is maybe two or four years old. So I, I think that, that that's 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 part of it. So all right. Well, any qu other questions on Rule Ten? Yeah, Gary. Uh, I'm going to ask three. I guess it's a question of semantics, but we all know okay. you gave the emphasis on their words. So why do they use the, the word must in two places in that paragraph? Uh, in terms of um, and I think you could argue that because of the final sentence of saying that 10-1C or 10-2C applies, that it doesn't matter that much. And they probably just err on saying, on using the match play work term must, because they're trying to be efficient and write the write it for both match play and stroke play. Um, so well, let's see. Uh, yeah. And it's, uh, and I, th I think that that's it. And I think the final sentence really uh, renders the point somewhat moot by saying what the answer is if, in fact, someone plays out of turn. Uh, that it's, uh, um, like I said, they had to pick either must or should. And it was gonna, one way or another, it was going to be wrong. That, for example, if it used should, then you know, a valid question would be, well, why doesn't it say must? And <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, well, let's finish up with uh, rule 11 for the day. There, we just talked about the team or the uh, order of play. So uh, let's talk about how the players will actually start pl uh, play of the hole. Rule 11 1 When a player is putting the ball into play from the team ground, it must be played from within the team ground and from the surface of the ground or from a conforming tee in or on the surface. So several things you have to play from within the team ground. Rule 11 4, we'll talk about that in more detail. And then it's very specific as to how, how the ball can be teed. It either has to be on the, on the surface of the ground, which we see later includes an irregularity of surface, which could be created by the player, um, or a conforming tee in or on the surface of, of the uh, ground. So, you know. Uh, this has largely been with us since 2004, but previously, people would probably remember a player might get to a hole where he wanted a big high shot and would tee his ball on a pencil. Uh, but now, uh, since a pencil is not meet the definition of tee, that would not be permissible. Uh, in PGA USGA uh, rules classes, they show a video of John Daly teeing his ball on a Diet Coke can and hitting it off that during competition. And that has not been permissible since 2004. So it's uh, pretty specific. But if a player makes a stroke at a ball on a non-conforming tee or a ball teed in a manner not permitted, he is disqualified. And note one, one of the stipulations with the tee back in Appendix 4 is that it can't be longer than 4 inches. Uh, but it doesn't matter that if you take a five inch tee and you press it in the ground two inches, only three inches is above the ground, that is still a non conforming tee you're using. If you make a stroke at a ball with it, you are disqualified. All right, 11 2 uh, tee markers, which are kind of interesting objects that obviously serve an important uh, role uh, or function on the golf course. Before a player makes his first stroke, uh, with any ball from, from the team ground, the T markers are deemed to be fixed. In these circumstances, if the player moves or allows to be moved a T marker for the purpose of avoiding interference with his stance, or even tenant swing, or his line of play, he incurs the penalty for breach of Rule 13 2. So, if let's say if it's a uh, do dog leg right, and you're trying really hard to stand at the very uh, left edge of the team ground, but this uh, big T marker is in your way, you just can't move it out of the way. Uh, um, that if you do so, that would be a breach of Rule 13 2. But then uh, right next to it, you might just jot down decision 11 2 slash 2. And we won't go through these, but this 
has a list of, situ of five situations where a player moves a, a T marker for various reasons. It could be that he thinks the T markers aren't lined up correctly or in the wrong place, or he lifts the T marker just because it's an interesting decorative item and he wants a closer look at it, or because he's upset with it and kicks it or swats it with his club. And the decision will uh, tell us the uh, ruling in each case. In some cases, there's a penalty. In some cases, there's not a penalty. In some cases, <coughs> Uh, the player is required to replace the team marker before anyone plays. Can I still ask the question about 11 dash 1? Yeah. Okay. What, what is the determination of a conforming team? Oh, what's a conforming team? Back, back in Appendix 4 in the back of the rules book, it has, what's that? 5? 583. Yeah, it talks about several stipulations. It says, among other things, a, uh, T must not be longer than four inches, must not be designed or manufactured in such a way that it could indicate line of play, must not unduly influence the movement of the ball, such as you can't, sometimes you see a T that has kind of a cuff that comes between the club face and the ball to try to reduce the spin. John, the other thing you did, the windless rule was uh, of T's on all the sides, so it was put into effect. Uh, yeah, it was put in, I think, 2004. And part of the reason for that is that they started seeing long drive competitions. Players were using very, very long tees. And the, actually, the organizers of long drive competitions approached the USGA saying, just so you know, this is coming. This could well be an issue uh, with tee height. So prior to that, John Daly may have been OK on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Prior to that, that was OK. Prior to that, it was OK to use a pencil. Uh, and you see other uh, odd things. When I first started playing, there was a sandbox on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that, 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 that's still okay to use. You can still create a little pinch of sand. Sports drawn. Lake Park. Park. Oh, oh, oh. But the sand pile can't be more than four inches high. No, no. Actually, the, there's no limit for the sand pile. Right. You can. Yeah. My father told me about the sandbox. Oh, um, <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I do have a question. Who the hell could afford to come up with a team <laughs> last year? Under Rule 13 2, you're allowed to create an irregularity of surface on the team ground to see a ball. We had a player who we won't mention a name would slam his driver into the ground, beating what I would call a two to three inch hole in the team ground, and then would place his ball on the front edge of that and strike it off the ground and then leave the tee, leaving this gigantic gouge in the tee. Certainly, there isn't a rule that prohibits that. But the suggestion on how they were. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, it's, 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 um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting case. Back when I worked for the USGA at the uh, US Women's Open each year, when another staff member and I would go around and set tee markers in the morning, we could always see where Laura Davies had played the year before, but she would do this, or the day before, but she would do the same thing slam her driver in the ground or, or her one or two iron and get to tee the ball. And sometimes you look at it and say, gee, this just isn't good. What if every player in the field did this? Uh, and from a rules of golf perspective, there's really nothing you can do to prohibit it. I, I think uh, there are other ways to look at it from, say, a disciplinary matter. Say, look, obviously the rules of golf allow you to do this, but uh, if you want to continue to be eligible to play in our tournaments, you need to repair it after you play from it. You know, or other, uh, just, just say some, something like that. Could be actually how we handle it, but there were a number of players. Because it's addressed in the etiquette section. Yeah. Right. It's in the etiquette yeah. section yeah. now. There were a number That's of players true. that wanted this player you know, disqualified. All right, 11-3, uh, ball falling off T. If the ball when not in play, so meaning before, uh, first stroke with that ball, falls off a tee or is knocked off a tee by the player, may be re-teed because there's no penalty because the ball's not in play. But if the stroke is made 
even if the ball's moving, the stroke is stroke counts, but there's no penalty. So there would be no penalty for playing a moving ball in such circumstances. 11-4, uh, somewhat like uh, uh, order of play, you get very different uh, results in match play and stroke play if a player plays from outside the team ground. Match play, if a player, when starting the hole, plays from outside the team ground, there's no penalty, but his opponent has the option. Let the stroke stand or require the player to uh, play from within the team ground. In stroke play, though, it's a different uh, situation. Because in stroke play, remember, we need to make sure that all players in the field play the same course, which means starting each hole from the same spot and finishing each hole to the same hole location. Uh, so in stroke play, if a player plays from outside the team ground, he incurs a penalty of two strokes and must correct that mistake uh, before teeing off on the next hole or be disqualified. Now, one point to keep in mind uh, with uh, actually both of these sections is that Rule 11-4 applies only when you're starting play of the hole. It does not apply to any subsequent strokes from the team ground. So let's say, for example, that in, uh, let's say both match play and stroke play, that I play from within the teeing ground and the ball goes out of bounds. So now I have to come back to the tee under stroke and distance. And I tee up and play from a foot outside the teeing ground. So in match play, what's the ruling? Match play is a loss of hole penalty. I've, I've simply played from the wrong place. In stroke play, I've played from the wrong place, and, but it wouldn't be uh, what we call a serious breach because I haven't gained a significant advantage. So in stroke play, what would be the total penalty in that case? It would be three penalty strokes. One penalty stroke for going out of bounds, and then two more for playing from the wrong place. So this is, that it, the key point there is that this is not a Rule 11-4 situation. Once I played the first tee shot from within the team ground, then Rule 11-4 no longer applies. So really what I was in breach of was the out of bounds rule. So a combination of 27-1 and 20-5. Uh, All right, let's see some decisions. One decision that uh, it's uncanny that uh, uh, people really like to talk about, I guess it's interesting, is 11-5 uh, slash 3. A played B in a match. A drove out of bounds from the wrong team ground. B did not recall the stroke. What's the ruling? Well, the question is, how does A go about then putting his ball into play from that wrong team ground? Well, what's the status of that wrong team ground? It's through the green, because mm -hmm. it, it is, in fact, not his team ground. So, when you have to proceed under stroke and distance through the green, how do you do so? By dropping the ball. Exactly. So, all right, any questions on Rule 11? All right, well, if not, well, we'll call it, call it a day. And next week, Bill, I think we're on, on Friday. Is that right? No, Thursday. Thursday. Oh, are we? Okay, all right. Next week, too? We're next week. Thursday. 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 Okay. All right. So next week is Thursday, and we'll start on Rule 12, then we'll hit Rule 13, which is a very big rule, and uh, we'll have a good time. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so 11-4-B-3, if there are no T markers or if there's one T marker, what, what do you, oh, and actually, no, 11-4-B, what, two or three? Three. Three. Okay, let's see, so three is when both are missing. Well, I mean, obviously, that's a pretty big point because if you're, if they're missing for your group, then they're going to be missing for every group behind. So it's going to, every group, it, it makes sense to try to get the issue squared away way with your groups because otherwise then the next group will be thinking what do we, what do we do 
Um, and it's and it's difficult because, and that's really one of the dangers with stroke play is that you really want to make need to make sure that everyone plays the same course. And uh, you know, the decision offers some leeway in terms of if you see the pink dots that were that indicate where it was, you could play from there, or you know, any other indication where it's clear where the team marker should be. But otherwise, the committee really needs to clarify where the team markers are. And this where you could have a real problem is let's say the team markers are in position for the first four groups and then all of a sudden they're gone. So you know four groups have already played from the right place and you need to make sure that everyone else plays from the same place. And that's why the committee more often than not needs to get involved just to make is the committee needs to say, look, this is the right place. And, and you're right, it could be a delay of uh, 10, 30 minutes, but you know, that's one thing that is interesting these days and something I keep forgetting about uh, that, but I know, you know, I've seen, you know, people in this room when they're fit, when they, you have just say two officials uh, at a tournament, sometimes put on local rule sheet, their cell phone numbers say, look, if something comes up, you know, call, call, call me, uh, call these two officials and hear their cell phone numbers, just to try to expedite things. Somewhere in my mind, I read where if there's one T box, then you still can't go. Uh, let's see the the previous. Yeah, I think the previous yeah, one. Yeah, you, then you've got to, you've still got to go. Yeah, well, in the, in the first one, it says 11 4 b 2 it says the correct procedure is to discontinue play until the committee resolves the problem. So that's correct. However, if the committee is satisfied the competitors did not gain an advantage, then the committee could accept their scores. So with one T marker, I think one T marker is a lot different than two T markers missing. So with one T marker, you're going to be in a general area, and it's pretty easy to tell where where you should be. Yeah. What if the uh, maintenance crew in mowing the tees, they take the T markers and they put them on a car. Oh. Usually, right, oh. mm -hmm. and they're sitting there, and it, he forgot to put them. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if he teed up, that would be okay, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I and mean, sometimes that can happen. Where, well, let's say you have a, a you know, long, narrow tee, and the uh, person knowing the tees removed the tee markers, just stuck them to the side in the rough, moved the tee markers, and didn't move them back. Player comes along, sees the tee markers in the rough, and plays between them. Well, I and mean, I think you could argue that's uh, you could say that's okay as long as everyone plays from there, uh, that's fine, and that's because um, that's where the T markers are. They weren't the committee didn't necessarily place them there for that purpose, but the committee could effectively give them their blessing. We've also got dots on the bench. Yeah, well, yeah, and then yeah, and, then, and that that's all, that's one point where if you have luxury in terms of staffing at tournaments to put a dot. Uh, to dot your T markers each day, like one white dot for the first round, two white dots for the second round. So if a T marker is moved, it's easy to tell uh, where it belongs. All right. Well, I hope uh, hope everyone has a, a good weekend. Look forward to seeing you all next uh, Thursday. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, John. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. Oh. Still